Sam Hazeldine back again, and for the second in our two-part series on burnout. Here with Henry Kurtz, and today we're gonna to talk about what to do if you've identified that this is an issue for you. Um, we're gonna talk about actions to take, and both Henry and I have been through this. You know, Henry was much quicker to identify and take action. I, I was a bit of a slow learner, and so I identified things late, which led to chronic issues for me, which took um, you know, a lot more dramatic change in my life. Um, so the earlier the better, but you know, we've talked in the series about identification. That's the first step. Um, what are the early signs? What are the late start signs? And then taking that perspective of, and it's not normal. I don't, that, or it doesn't need to be normal for me. My experience in medicine doesn't have to be one of tiredness, not caring, cynicism, you know, all these. My experience in medicine can be energized, enjoying my work, dealing with challenging issues, but doing it in a healthy way that doesn't sap the life out of me. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, you know, what, what you can actually do, five pillars that you can, you know, use to address burnout. But as, as well, you can use these five pillars to prevent it. You can use this as a healthy way to, um, you know, to manage your career in medicine. And the thing about burnout is that, you know, everyone's unique, everyone's experience is unique. You know, what, what it was for me, my story is completely different from Henry's, will be different from yours. Um, and, you know, because to some extent, it's, you know, a lot of the symptoms are our body's response to this chronic stress, it can manifest in very different ways for each, each of us. And so, because there's no one single presentation, and, and we talked about this in the last one, because probably the definition of burnout needs to be somewhat updated and expanded, um, there is no one size fits all. So we're gonna give you, as I said, five pillars that you can use and some principles that you can use to figure out where to start for you. Um, what do you reckon, Henry? Yeah, that sounds good. It's always nice to, to break things down into sort of simple steps, I think, as well, because um, undoubtedly, if people are feeling burned out and stressed, um, you know, they don't have a lot of capacity to, to, I mean, it's, you don't have a lot of capacity to look into these things or the energy to really analyze them. So I think simple, simple is good. And um, the five pillars is a great concept. So yeah, let's do it. We'll go through this. And I think as you're listening, uh, you know, we'll go through all five, obviously. Don't don't leave us after pillar one and think that's the answer. But listen to all five. And then and then at the end, we'll talk about, you know, figuring out where you can start. And, and I think there's some intuition here. Sometimes we just got to, we just got to start. And so, you know, we'll, I'll say it again, and I'll probably say it multiple times through this. Everyone's experience of burnout is unique. Everyone's prescription for how to deal with it is going to be unique. And, you know, this is about progress. This is about you know, making yourself more healthy, moving in the right direction, and you don't have to take the perfect action, but what we do want to do is make sure that you know that you can take some action. So, let's talk about these five pillars. What, you know, Henry, what is the first one? I guess it probably flows on from identification in a way, but it's some um, recognition, because you, without having an insight into what's going on, um, you're just gonna keep chugging along the path of destruction, basically. <laughs> yeah, you're not going to, you're not gonna make good a good tangent. So I think one of the first things I would say is um, there's objective and subjective ways of recognizing that. And that might be some of the things that we talked about previously, like red flags. And an objective way might be to do like a um, questionnaire or objective sort of burnout measure to see how, how you're ranking. And I think that more and more I'm starting to realize that doing an objective measure is great because A, it shatters any, um, uh, you know, suppression or, you know, lack of insight that you might have, but it also can give you a sense of how you're stacking up um, because it can give you, it's not like a diagnosis like depression, but it's more like a sense of, um, how, am I experiencing burnout and how severe is it across a couple of domains in my life? So, and one thing I would say is if, if you're watching this or you have asked yourself the question, am I burnt out? The answer is probably yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> the answer is possibly yes, or maybe you're experiencing something other, yeah. <clears throat> 
If, if, if you're on to episode two of burnout, then uh, for a busy doctor, you're the red flag. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that, that would definitely be my experience. If you think you might, it's almost certainly yes. And I, to me, what I like about the word recognition is it almost takes identification a step further because identification is one thing, but recognition is also a personal acknowledgement. And I think we, you know, we have to not just go, okay, I'm, you know, uh, mentally, yep, I'm, I'm on a high on the scale. We actually have to acknowledge to ourselves, all right, this is a challenge for me. This is something that I need to deal with. And again, I just encourage you, you know, we don't normalize it. We actually just go, actually, I can be healthy in medicine. So the first bit is, to rec is, is recognition. And what's step two? For me, and I think a lot of people, step two is like probably the most, what's the word I can say? It's really the start of all the good things to come. And that is like signaling to your network that things are going well. And I've seen this manifest in different ways. Um, probably one of the classic ones that I've seen is like, uh, it's 6.30 p.m. in the computer room at the hospital and like everyone's gone home and this kind of, two interns left, both who are working two hours over time. And I think I've just, I've seen it a couple of times, like, you know, overheard one of them just, you know, signaling to their colleague that like, I think I'm not doing well. I think I'm like getting burnt out. Or it might be picking up the phone and like calling your mom or just telling your partner in black, black and white, you know, like I'm not doing well and I think I'm burnt out or something's going on. But it, it can be different for everybody but I think that saying it out loud and not in like a badge of honor, ha ha, cynical, sarcastic way, like, oh, I'm so burnt out, ha ha. You know, like this is a very poisonous like, way of thinking because people do that for a long time. They laugh about it. And um, that goes into the depersonalization, depersonalization cynicism pathway that's not good. So I think not laughing about it, telling someone point blank, what's going on for you. You don't have to have the solution yet and they don't have to have the solution yet either. But when you tell someone and in all seriousness how you're feeling or what's going on, um, there's going to be help materializing from directions you didn't know. Even your JMO manager or your, you know, someone in your administration, just telling them being really, you don't have to tell them all of raw details about what you're experiencing, but just telling them that you're not traveling well will create such a great direction for you because it's scary. And I remember distinctly picking up the phone and calling my mom during the floods and being like, I'm not, I'm not coping. I'm not coping, you know? And she flew down like the next day. And I mean, that was a super mom kind of effort, but she didn't know. And like, she could hear in my voice, you know, I was being, because I wouldn't normally say that. And I think a lot of doctors, a lot of healthcare workers, if they would say something like that, people often are shocked and take action quickly because there tend to be people who um, carry on and uh, bottle stuff up. So it's scary, but tell people in your network what's going on. That to me is the piece that I found through this and talking to doctors and myself is, is doctors are worried about being judged but actually what they might do is be really surprised at the support. I remember talking to a um, head of department who said, you know, we have to be good at, you know, if a doctor comes to me and says, I've got a challenge, we say, how can I help? You know, is it time off? Is it job check? We're going to talk about some other things. But essentially, um, you know, we, we, we had this impression, I think, still that there's this old guard and there's still sort of some, you know, who are running medicine saying this is how it was for us and this is how it's going to be for you, blah, blah, blah. But actually, you know, we've got a, there's a new generation of leadership in medicine who actually is supportive and actually want us to be healthy and thriving and looking after each other. And, and you know, I think from a professional perspective, from a personal perspective, that's the exciting bit is you, people should just pro will probably be surprised at how much support's actually there. One of the main things that it can create is like, an understanding from people in your network that your behavior is often not a reflection of your the way that you're relating to them because i think what happens for a lot of people is um they might be maybe they're both in healthcare and they might be relating to their partner or family differently and obviously people are going to assume like have i done something wrong like is it is it me like so there's at least some degree of understanding like if you 
need to go and lie in a dark room for an hour and not talk to anybody or you're not as emotionally available, um, at least they perhaps know why that is. And, and, and then it doesn't create like a, a chain of events, which means that then they're like, oh my God, this, this person is unavailable and non, non, uh, yeah, you know, have I done something wrong? And yeah, resentful. And it just creates a, a yeah, a avalanche of that stuff. So, mm. Resentful, blah, 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 down that road. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's, I think, what I found the most common thing doctors say about their, for their families is they're actually relieved that they've, they've, the doctor has been vulnerable enough to say, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, you know, oftentimes partners are like, well, thank goodness it's not me or kids or whoever. And people will start telling you their stories. That's what happened to me. People were like, I feel like you, I feel like you do right now. Or I felt like that six months ago. And you'll be like, oh, it is a relief for everybody. It's a relief for the individual. It's a relief for the family. It's a relief for your peers who are also validating how they feel. So it's, look, I think, you know, you don't want to throw it around too much. You want to perhaps find the right moment. Um, and if you're telling your network you're not doing well too often, it's probably a strong sign that, yeah, things need to be reevaluated. We ignore, recognize, acknowledge it in ourselves. We, we signal to our network. We enlist the help, help. We don't, we're not on this alone. And so then let's talk about the next three pillars, which are thing, you know, three pillars that we can address and probably need to address. Each one of these, none of these three can be neglected. Um, so the first pillar being, you know, your body. Talk, let's talk about that. Well, you know, eating, moving, sleeping. Why is that so important? You know, I'm not an integrative doctor, so I probably can't speak about like the elements in, in depth. We, we, we're going to have an episode specifically on body and one on mind as well. So we're going to go deep into each of these, but, but let's talk about the importance. As a general rule for myself, and I think a lot of people, you know, that um, it's very, very difficult for you to access higher cognitive centers or like, you know, the rational mind or even start to process or debrief um, certain things with a psychologist or therapist. Um, if you're not feeling like physically well and grounded. And for me, that was kind of a lesson that I learned primarily because there were no psychologists in the region during the floods who were left to take on new patients. So my first, my, I mean, I don't encourage anybody to, to see a psychologist if they can get in, but my first experience was like, okay, I can't see a psychologist. Like, and that's one of the, one of the reasons why we started Wombat as well. Um, but one of the, that first feeling of like, fuck, okay, I've told my network that I'm not doing well. Cool, I'm ready, I'm ready for change, I'm ready to take action. I'm looking for a psychologist, there's no help. So for me, um, yeah, yoga, um, doing yin yoga, which is like a really, really, really slow, like gentle, restorative kind of yoga. It's not like the fast paced action sweaty one, it's more like stretching, like low grade stretching, was the perfect first step for me out of what I could leverage from what's available to me, but also a mechanism to slow down and get grounded. And that for, I remember so distinctly that first like um, session of stretching and yin yoga that I did, um, because the first session was like hell. <laughs> I was like, I can't do this. I can't sit still for more than 10 seconds. Everyone's lying down around me, like smiling and relaxed and my mind was just like just 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 yeah just like you know I was so my mind and body was like so restless and I was like I can't get through this hour like it's not possible and then like I remember she was like okay that was like the end of the class and I was like oh my god I survived and then I just kept going back and then there's a tipping point where you realize like that physical restlessness, the anxiousness or whatever it is that you're feeling, you can break that down. And as you do find things like skiing, or tennis, or surfing, or whatever it is that you can access in your environment or yin yoga, um, find physical practices that can get you grounded. Or actually, perfect example. I love this story. I met a, um, a German <laughs> orthopedic surgeon who was like really, really burnt out. And um, this is probably a very dramatic thing today. They took time off and they said the best, the thing that helped them the most was like renovating their garage. 
So basically every day they'd get up in the morning, they'd put on their goggles, they put on their mask, they had a big mallet and they would just smash down walls and, you know, whatever it is that they were doing. But the physicality of it and the, the physical release of doing that thing allowed them to release the physical tension. And I think that, you know, that burnout and particularly late, late stages of burnout, there's going to be, when you do slow down and check in, you're going to find a lot of tension and a lot of physical um, disturbances that are going to be confronting to deal with. But I believe personally that you probably, it's probably a good idea to even start there. And so, yeah, and then as well, like just the obvious things, like you mentioned, eat, move and sleep, you know, like if you can give yourself a few weeks off work or you can get some weeks off work, um, get started with some of the physical stuff. It might just be aerobic exercise, high interval training, which is good for people who don't have a lot of time, high interval High intensity interval training for those people who don't have a lot of time um, and like yeah getting nourishing sleep and eating well and that'll probably get you to a stage where you're like whoa I need to deal with some of this psychological stuff that's going on but you're gonna be having the resilience and like reserves to deal with that because if I am I imagined if I you know day one in yoga where I couldn't sit still for five minutes if I took that energy into a one hour psychology session, it's just gonna, it's just gonna create more and more attention. So you've gotta, you've gotta find ways to get grounded physically. And I think that's probably the main message that I would convey, yeah. Okay, so we start you know, potentially with our body. Um, and we, do we do it in a way that is restorative? I think that's a really important piece. You don't have to start marrow, you know, train for an ultra marathon. Um, we want to restore ourselves, get the body going, so that we can then focus on the fourth pillar, um, which is mind. Um, now, in saying that, someone else may decide I got to start with mind first. Um, so that you know, everyone's prescription is different. So let's let's talk about the mind, and and we are going to go deep on this with Kate. Um, specifically around some of the belief structures and things and, and, and ways to actually approach that. Um, we're also going to, we've got a, a section specifically on purpose, which is really important and we can talk a bit about that. Um, and we have a, you know, a section on mind, mindfulness and meditation. So, you know, we are going to go deep into these areas because these are really important and these are critical areas um, to actually be thriving, you know, and not normalizing the, the burned out doctor but normalizing a doctor who can handle things so just you know from a mind perspective where would you start after you know, when i was taking some time off work from the floods I, I we built like a meditation app for burnout and trauma so i could probably you know give talk a little bit about that i did i did also do the sort of breath work meditation teacher training and didn't really work in the field specifically but it gave me a lot of great knowledge and i think that um one thing i would say is First of all, if you can get a physical sense of being grounded through whatever that mechanism is for you, having some kind of mindfulness or meditation practice um, is good. It is very powerful. And I think particularly at nighttime, because that tends to be when people can most consistently do it. So like the whole wake up in the morning meditation thing, it works for some people, but maybe you've got kids or maybe you're at work, go, got to go to work. So I would say try to cultivate like a nighttime mindfulness or meditation practice is really really good place to start particularly um one thing one of one piece of advice i'd give is try to if you uh, have a partner try to um try to get them excited about it too try and do it try and do it together with someone because that's that's a really nice because particularly burnout causes a lot of relationship stress so trying to find like a meditation practice you can do at night time with your partner it's going to be good for your um, consistency and accountability and potentially help you um, heal some of the tension you might be experiencing in relationship as well. So I would recommend the Wombat app. We did make it specifically to create very pragmatic and simple um, sessions that people can do. Um, you know, they range from like six to 15 minutes. They're not, they're not difficult. They're not spiritual. You know, they're created by psychologists and doctors and physios. So they're very like, um, you know, well, well sort of thought out. And I think just one practice that I do love and really did, it really did change my life was, um, yoga nidra. So, um, yoga nidra is, um, 
uh, yeah, it's a form of like a guided meditation, I guess. Um, it was actually, it's been formally researched a lot um, with people who have anxiety, stress and PTSD. And so there's a lot, there's a big body of evidence showing um, its effectiveness in helping people get grounded. So it's also a very good meditation for people to do that are like, I can't do meditation because it's very um, focused and you go through very specific stages and there's kind of these just distraction focus elements to it. So if you're struggling to do a meditation or you feel like you're not a meditation person, try and find, we have them on the app or you can find them on YouTube, try and find some yoga nidra exercises. Um, that's probably a really good one to do. Um, but I think as well, like you, you touched a little bit on purpose and it sounds like you're gonna do a whole, whole episode on, on that as a theme. I think, and I really like what you said earlier on, which is like, you know, you know, thinking maybe I'm not good enough, maybe I'm not smart enough to be a doctor, maybe I can't cut it, maybe I should just quit. You know, it was such a great point that you made, which is like, you're probably not in the right headspace to be making those kind of decisions. So like, when you do start to go down the road of like, what kind of doctor do I want to be? How do I want to do it? What's the meaning? What's the purpose? What's the point? Like, trying to make sure that you are having those thoughts and conversations when you have built up some layers of like resilience and stability because if you're if you're asking yourself those questions on day one like just let them come in don't push them away but give them a bit of space and be like yeah give it a few weeks like give it a few months even just say i'm not okay i'm not going to send that email if the one thing that i have learn in life is like if you've wrote a really passionate long email try your best not to send it immediately like give, you've got to, you've got to give it a few weeks good 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 metaphor for life isn't it i mean i, I think what, what if, if i listen to what you've said to me the mind component of burnout is about going from a sort of a chronic stress strain of a mind to a small still and i think you know there are different ways to achieve that stillness one is purpose you know we, you know, our minds are constantly searching when we're not feeling like we're on purpose. Um, mindfulness and meditation and just figuring out which one it is that's useful for you. Um, tackling those, you know, unrealistic expectations about yourself and prioritizing yourself and then, you know, getting some help. Um, you know, you've talked about psychology. Um, you know, there's, there's therapy. I think being open-minded to which help is, is useful. Um, uh, uh, you know, just you know, having debriefing sessions with your colleagues. Um, for for me, actually, it was an NLP practitioner who helped me the most. Um, and so, so I think you know, keeping an open mind as to what form is going to help you, because again, everyone's prescription is different. Mm. And as well, like just respecting the um, timeline, because like, you know, let's say you're feeling burnt out, and you're like, great, we're going to get a psychologist. You can, you can see one the next day, but. And you're like, this isn't working. Like, what's wrong with me? You know, like, I'm, I'm still, after six months, I still feel bad. And I think just, just considering, like, you know, like we talked about the five pillars, considering the fact that you need to have a comprehensive, and this is kind of why we've been developing this burnout program through Wombat and stuff, because you do need to consider, like, the different pillars of progression and, like, not just investing everything in like i'm going to do psychology and they're going to fix me but really being honest with yourself and being like actually you know maybe i just need to see a counselor and just do a bit of debriefing first just get a bit get a bit off my chest and then do oh i'm gonna get back into running doing some running doing some debriefing I'm sleeping a little bit better things are improving things are getting better and then and then four months later you're like whoa, that memory keeps coming back of that thing. I think I need to go and do some structured processing and psychology around that. Then you'll be like, you're going to be in a brilliant position to potentially deal with the more deep or complex stuff when you are heading in the right direction. But I think you're feeling not frustrated or sad if the things that you thought would fix you are not, particularly if you're continuing to do the same job because that's, that's difficult. So let's let's talk about the fifth pillar because that is really important and it's the it's the pillar that we often want to ignore um, because it feels like maybe the hardest one to change um, but you know it's our environment um, and you know when we're, particularly we're talking about you, the work environment 
So let's talk about what are some of the work modifications that people can um, take uh, in, in order to um, you know both get out of burnout and and you know and and then we'll talk about you know career potential career modifications to ensure they don't doesn't come back. I guess signaling to your network probably connects very quite well to environment because let's say uh, you know for example you're PGY two you're a resident like things are going well in your first year but things are starting to derail you know if you um, signal to your you know, to the administration and also to your family at the same time, um, both parties and yourself might be able to sort of come up with some novel modifications. Because at the end of the day, like we said earlier on in the piece, like, you know, ultimately everybody does want happy, productive doctors who are not going to quit the profession or quit, you know, what they're doing, particularly if they love it. So um, that's probably signaling to your network is a great, sort of segue into work modifications and I think as well um, you know work is becoming um, more, more discussed in the workplace now too so I think and I think if people are starting to realize if they create modifications early they might not sort of lose a staff member permanently so uh, there's a lot of different ways of doing it and it's I guess, specific to someone's like life circumstances but um you know taking taking a couple of weeks off is probably a good place to start I think if you can leverage a few, like let's say two weeks off, and in that two week period, um, start to do some of the stuff that we talked about, let's say debrief a little bit, start running, start eating well, getting some sleep if you can, or even just noticing how you're feeling. Because a lot of the time when we're working so much, we don't check in with ourselves. Um, during that period of time off, you're going to probably be able to establish have I got burnout and how severe is it? And it, Combining that with doing something objective like the Copenhagen Burnout Index, you, you're going to be able to, um, I guess, prepare for what's to come. And so it might be after those two weeks off, um, you could go back to where you're working and say, okay, I'm feeling a little bit better, but I've also noticed that I'm objectively in a severe burnout stage. And I've sort of started to do some debriefing with a counsellor and they have recommended that I might do part-time for the next sort of six months to get me on the right right track. Or I think going to a GP is a great place because they see people all the time with burnout and they can also um, throw their weight behind your, your situation. And I think, you know, GPs are good advocating for us because sometimes we feel nervous or scared about admitting that we're, we're struggling or whatever. But if you can get perhaps like a, you know, a good letter of support from your GP to send to your you know, your administration staff, just to give them some understanding of what's going on and maybe some recommendations for what might be good for you, um, that can, you can start to be creative about how, you, how you're doing it. Um, and I think these environmental changes are so potent in the early phase where you're able to change course early because if, let's say, you, you let things run for years and years, um, the environmental modifications might, be, might literally be quit medicine and never go back like that's that happens that's i've seen it happen exactly and i think that's a great way of framing uh, to put in perspective some of these early changes you know oh, I, I, you know if you're feeling worried about asking for two weeks off at short notice but it's two weeks that might prevent you know a career that finishes you know prematurely um i love i i would love to see some research happen where people are going in an early diversion program of burnout, I think the results would be like mind blowing for everybody from a financial, psychological work. There's so many benefits for the hospital or for the administration to really get behind staff. And I think framing that first bit as taking some time out to create some space to start the healing process. That's a great way to look at the two weeks. You know, it's not like take two weeks and go to Ibiza. Uh, it's you know it's actually start the process, create some space to make those you know those body and mind changes, and then you know that might be enough. But if not, then the next step is you know as you say, you've got support from your you know your GP or, or, or whoever to go. I need to do some part time for a while, and again framing it in a way that you know my goal is to get back to full time. But if I don't do this now. You know, I don't, this doesn't look like it's going in a great direction. 
because you know the next step is to leave completely until you're better and that's you know much more drastic but sometimes required a more subtle one which uh is um commute and driving and i think that's really fascinating because like Lately, um, I've been doing less in hospital clinical work and I've been doing a little bit of like telehealth work. I've noticed the, you know, the impacts of driving. And I think a lot of people who have like a, a bus or train or drive commute, just take, just having an awareness of what are the things around work which cr can create tension and stress and looking for creative ways to modify that. It might be changing where you rent a house. Go get closer to your hospital or your place of work so that you can walk to work rather than take a 40 minute stressful drive. Where, because the, the drive, the drive for me, like particularly during the floods was probably the worst part of work. It was like 45 minutes through this apocalyptic zone with like military trucks and floating cows and rivers, you know, that environment was probably what was a big factor in my burnout. So Look at the whole picture. Don't just look at like your shift. Look at what happens during the shift before and after, even what rituals you can create before and after shifts. It might be what rituals you can create during your shift. So one thing I really advocate for people to do is um, if they can, <laughs> the situation is appropriate, um, go off to a toilet somewhere, somewhere you can get, be completely alone in hospital and try and do like two or three minutes of breath work or breathing exercises and like put your, put your phone away if you can and creating these little environmental shifts because when you walk out of the toilet after doing or the bathroom for those two or three minutes of breathing exercises, you're gonna re-enter the day in a different, in a different flow. So just get, cre get creative and like start to just look at it as, a, as an interesting puzzle and get curious about it. Be like, what if we moved closer to the hospital and I could walk to work? How would that change my day? Would that, would that re-divert me? Or um, yeah, can I go part-time? And I have to admit, and this is definitely not a, a pitch for, for Med Recruit, but Locumine did save my, my bacon because like, it does give you a lot of autonomy and flexibility because I think for a lot of people, loss of autonomy and feeling trapped can really um, continue the cascade of, um, of burnout because when someone and not all not all managers are understanding or even believe in burnout or, or care about it so you might wave the flag signal to your network hey i'm not doing well and they'll be like well we need a renal registrar you're it we can't give you time off so when you are stuck in a system that is not supporting you, um, it's going to be bloody difficult to like um, make progress. If you're in a supportive environment, it's like, hey, yeah, like take a few weeks off, come back part time for those months. We're going to reassess. Hey, use this employee assistance program. You're going to be in a good position where your env your environment is supporting you back. And I think that that's a big question people have to ask themselves. Is like. I've done all this work, I've reached all these insights and acknowledgements with myself. I've told my environment, I've told my work network that things are, these things are going on. Is there a reciprocity from your environment or not? And I think that's often a, a red flag in itself for am I likely to continue down this path? Is if there's no sense of reciprocity or support, you're gonna be battling this probably quite alone. and. So I think, yeah, just get creative, get flexible, leverage your network, wave the flag early. And um, I think a big one that I hear from a lot of people and I, I see much more severe burnout in this group of people is like early consultant, young children. <laughs> like this, this combination of things tends to be a very potent, scary mixture of like, uh, burnout that is rampant and not getting addressed because they just finished, they're, they're, they're exhausted, they've just done their exams, they've done all this amazing stuff and it's competitive to get a consultant job. They don't want to tell them uh, they're stressed, they're overworked, they're burnt out, they, they, they don't want that complication so they take the job, they've now got the consultant job of their dreams and just might have a couple of kids in the background as well and now they've got a mortgage because they're their income just skyrocketed. So now they have 
the mortgage, the new job, a couple of young kids, and they, I've just heard it from a few people, they're just in a vice and they are so scared and they feel so trapped. And I think that that cohort of people, I think really need more attention and help. Um, and we need to really need to create more space for like particularly junior consultants to, um, you know, get support and not be scared to, to admit what's going on for them. Absolutely. As you say, gr- you know, thing, great things in their lives can, can all contribute to the burnout. I, I think something that you, you know, I think one thing that's really important there is about, um, you know, making sure that you are in a supportive work environment uh, and, and not only feeling okay with voting with your feet if you don't have one, but almost being incumbent upon you to vote with your feet. Um, you know, when we, you know, um, lobbied the World Medical Association and we had, um, you know, a, 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 amended to the Declaration of Geneva, the modern Hippocratic Oath, I will attend to my own health, well-being and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. Like, it's actually incumbent upon us to do that. And I think when, you know, so, sometimes, you know, I think doctors feel like I'd be letting, you know, the hospital or whatever down, but actually, um, you know, you get what you tolerate. And we, as a profession, get what we tolerate. So if we tolerate bad managers and we tolerate managers who don't support people who are going through burnout, then, then we are part of, we're feeding the problem. And so, you know, I think it's okay to give doctors permission to go, you know what, they're not listening to me. I will go work in another hospital. I will take some time out in locum. I'll, you know, I'll do whatever. But I will, you know, it's actually okay to do that. And that's, that's actually being part of the solution. And I think that is one of the one of the perks of medicine is like you do there are a lot of opportunities for you and like locamine is potentially one of them and I think it's like you know you can create a lot of opportunities for yourself if you um, you know are willing to be honest with yourself about, about your current life circumstances so I think um, realizing that I mean it's t- obviously if you're an intern and you haven't completed your primary years like it's it's difficult because you you know you need to have everything approved and you need to be confident that you're if you wanted to do some flexible work I mean that it's appropriate but um that just realize you do have a lot of um you have more leverage and power than you think you might have and more choices and options than you think you might have too I think that's the thing you know we've, we've given again people are a myriad of options take a holiday to start the process you know talk to your employer to go part-time leave for a while you know, go and work as a locum or whatever. Again, I'm not trying to plug, but you know, there are different things we can do. You know, um, to you know, in, you know, including looking at the career path, the specialty path that I'm on, and is it going to support me and my lifestyle? But the beauty is, there are a lot of levers you can pull, and 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 I think for doctors, because we're in short supply, you know, there are options available to us. You know, and, and, and that's a great thing. So you so you so you have more choice, more option than you might think. You. Yeah gone through years and years of training you know you've you've acquired a lot of knowledge over the years and um like you said like there's a lot of um, demand for doctors so if you're in an environment that is not um supporting you like just just consider changing and one more thing i would say is like try to remove your ego as much as you can from the decisions that you make and i think like only a few weeks ago i kind of made a pretty big life decision for me which was like i realized that long term like, because I'm a bit of a sensitive person and I think I realised that working in a hospital environment long-term, particularly as a full-time doctor, was just not going to work for me. And so I kind of decided to do GP training. I'll start GP training in May. And, like, it was quite a relief just to sort of, like, let that sink in. And I never really thought about it much. And I think because of, probably because of ego, I think ego was blocking me from just, like, keeping my um, eyes open to different different pathways. And I think... You know, after six or seven years working in a hospital system, I just realized like this is going to be an arduous route, and I'm not really clear about what training I would want to do anyway. So GP is just like pretty fan- pretty fantastic option for me, and I think yeah, just trying to. I've met so many people who spent years of unnecessary suffering, hammering away, trying to get into a training program or doing a training program. And they were, inher- you know, fundamentally very burnt out and sad and dissatisfied and poorly remunerated. And then 
they ended up doing something like GP and they're like, this is great. I love my new life. So just keep an open mind about what might be good for you or what might bring you uh, happy and fulfilled existence. Don't, and medical school, and that might be GP, that might be something more creative, you know, but the medical school is very good at brainwashing you that a uh, consultant position in a hospital system is like the pinnacle of your life, you know? <laughs> it's like, this is like what, this is what you need to be happy. You know? And we're susceptible to that thinking, you know, to get into medical school, you kind of had to, at some point in school, go, there's only one thing I want to do and I'm going to work as hard as it takes to get in. So, you know, we're, 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 uh, we're low-hanging fruit for that type of thinking. And all of our lecturers in medical school are consultants in a hospital, you know, in a hospital. So I think just open your mind, particularly if you take a few weeks or a few months off, just like don't try to force your career decisions. I think the other piece, just to finish that point, would be, you know, and... Um, you know, I'm 45, so looking back, you know, life looks different at 45 than it did when I was 25 graduating. And um, what you realize is there, there isn't a race, and also these aren't one-way doors. You can go through, you can step through something, you can step back, you know, you know and, and through with, you know, with med recruit, with dealing with, you know, working with thousands, literally thousands of doctors every year. We see all the doctors who are taking um, not the traditional route, uh, and they, you know, some of them end up, you know, GP, some of them end up in specialty training at 40 or there, there actually isn't a race. And I think, you know, taking the pressure out is quite useful when it comes to the career. So, 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 so I think, you know, let, let's go, okay, you, we've listened to, you've got these, we've, we've talked about the five pillars, um, you know, recognition, signaling to your network, and then addressing the body, mind and environment. Now it's time to start going, okay, where do I start? Um, and, and I think the first part, as we talk about, it is actually recognition and, you know, let's understand the severity. So, you know, the Copenhagen burnout assessment, we're going to link to that. That's a great place to start because then, you know, the, you know step two is signaling to the network. Enlisting the network and, 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 and to some extent, you know, enlisting the scale of the response to those three areas, the mind, the body and the environment. Would, would, would you add anything to that? No, I think that's great. I'm really glad that I've had an opportunity to, to do, have these talks with you because it's uh, I've been thinking about it a lot and particularly realising the um, importance of doing like an objective burnout measure um, because it's just such a simple, clear way to, to gain some insight. So I think you're right. Like asking yourself the question, am I... Am I doing okay? And am I potentially burnt out? Doing an objective measure like the you know, Copenhagen burnout score, and then signaling to your network. It might even just be as simple as that. Like you, you've 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 made more ground in those three steps than sometimes people make in five years. <laughs> like some people will, will go for years and years, not never ask them. Well, they might say I'm burnt out, ha, 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 ha. but ask themselves like, am I a little bit too burnt out here? You know, being honest with himself, quantifying is it objectively true and how severe is it? And then having a raw and honest and vulnerable chat with people or sending them a message and saying like, I just did this burnout score and I'm like off the charts in all domains. I think something needs, you know, I think I need to make some changes in my life. So. That's like, you can't, if you make those like three steps, you, it's very hard to turn your back on that and ignore it. I think, and even for me, like I said, doing the score like a couple of weeks ago was kind of mind, it was you know, opened my mind to some, some structural changes that I had to make in my life. And now I'm feeling like I'm in a, in a much better position. And I think that that's the beauty of doing something objective is you can, you can, uh, the mental judo that you do with yourself and the suppression and the denialism, you, numbers don't lie. So, you know, do something objective, yeah. Absolutely. Um, look, I think this, these two conversations that have been, have been fantastic. And I think, you know, the, the, the big cons to take away from me is while burnout is normal, let's not normalise it. 
Um, and that's the, if you just come away from this, listening to this or watching this thing going, well, there's, there's a, there is a better way. And, and then approaching this with the things we've talked about from a perspective of, you know, small changes or medium sized changes now, you know, could have um, huge impacts to, to my life and career and whether I'm a doctor who just struggles through and makes, you know, and, and, and becomes one of the, the norm, or, you, know, um, you know, tired, disillusioned, um, you know, um, uh, not, not enjoying, you know, you're not caring, you know, or actually I can, you know, I'm in a great state. I'm, I feel good. I've got energy. I'm dealing with challenging situations, but I can do it well. You know, I think, you know, that, that's the opportunity that, you know, early burnout offers a young doctor um, is the chance to actually become a better person. You know, I, I have a belief in life that, you know, you should never, um, you know, try to just solve a crisis. You should try to transcend it because if you just try and solve it, you keep doing, you, you keep doing what got you into that state in the first place. Whereas if you go, I'm going to transcend it, I'm going to come out better than I ever was before, then you can prevent that same thing in the future. And I think that's the approach to burnout that we can, we can make. Mm-hmm. 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 Yep. Yep. Exactly. It's it's ridiculous, you know. But, but and that's the systemic stuff. But absolutely, and I, you know, that's a great point. Is you know, if, if you've seen this now, deal with it when you you get a blood a pre, a blood test at forty and your lipids are high, rather than waiting till you're you know in a, having a myocardial infarction. You know, let's you start early. This is this is a great opportunity. Um, you know, and I just leave you with any step is a good step. You know, the first bit is, yes, I understand where I'm at. This is about progress, not perfection. Um, you've recognized it. Start with, the, you know, you start with telling people. Enlist other people. Mind is always a part of it. You know, no question. That's why I'm going to have a specific interview with Kate Nelson, Wombat's lead clinical psychologist about, you know, who has a wealth of knowledge experience, you know, working with doctors through burnout. And, you know, I'd encourage you just to, just to start. You know, burnout can feel daunting, it can feel messy, uh, it can paralyze people because they don't know where to start, but it can also, if you reframe it, it can also be exciting to go, this is a step towards me becoming a better person and doctor. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's an old adage, but every journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. You know, you've probably taken that first step by listening, uh, and, and so now take it. I agree entirely. I think that's a really good message. And I, I would also just add that, like, you know, if you um, if you are in a position, like, I mean, if you do a score or objective measure or something, and you're scoring really high, don't look at that as like um, something that's negative. Look at that as like I'm actually so far ahead of my peers right now because I gained insight where many people are blind. And that you, if, and I think we talked about this in our preliminary chats, like you do want to get a little bit of urgency when you realize that. Like, I think for many people seeing the scores or seeing that you're high, high, high in all domains, you know, 
it does create a bit of fear, a bit of panic, but like see that as a positive thing. Like you've been given um, a gift or you've been given information. And if you take action and you act with like a little bit of urgency, a little bit of, you know, um, zest, you, you're going to change the course of your life in such an amazing way. So yeah, because at the end of the day, like you said, two out of three doctors, that 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 we can document so maybe it's even more than that are burnt out so we should you know hopefully over the next 10 years see that diminish to half and then maybe one third really it should be shouldn't like even one third is way too many and, and we can and that's what we're starting with here i think anyone listening now is significantly better equipped to understand and recognize within themselves and then start to make those changes and take those positive first steps so henry thank you so much for your insight um, and wisdom and sharing that i'm um, so openly um thank you to people listening um you know you, you as henry said you you put yourself in a position now where you know you know a lot more about this than most of us and most of the doctors and so use that take those first steps um because you can one final thing i would say is like like we talked about earlier on is that, um, you know, it's not an on off switch. It's always, if you work in medicine, it's always going to be there, but you are going to develop more insight and more tools to be like, well, I'm taking a week off cause I can see this and then like, boom, re divert, go back into a good zone. So it's a, it's a constant battle, but it can be, can be a fun battle and it can be a battle which you can ultimately win and be a happy doctor. So I think it's, Great, and kudos to you, Sam, for like um, doing this this course and bringing awareness to burnout because I think it's it's something that yeah it needs drastic change and we need to we need to we need to rally the energy and intelligence of the medical community to to change the status quo. So. Yeah.